<laughs> so we got the phalanx with through all the amazing technology, the wall cities, wheels, weaving, umbrellas, you name it. The Sumerians did it all. But let's go and get to. So when they started phalanx, it's also they start getting use of chariots. We see chariots usually the first chariots came down from the hit um, from the hills. I don't have a map up in front of me for what is now modern Iran down into the Sumerian Valley. Why chariots and not cavalry? You know, cavalry on horseback, you could that be more flexible. Chariot, you're tied to you know, the wheels, move relatively slow. You have to have an archer on the side. I do love this picture. It doesn't look like it's like a wind up horse. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to twist it. Yes. No, the horses were big enough. We were a good guess, but yeah. Yes. They, you know, that was still an issue, but they were becoming domesticated relatively fast by then. On a horse, yes. Hmm? Say it again. Now, you know, there was an element of that having an archer, but also you lose the flexibility because you can't go as far on the chariot because you need pretty flat ground. But you do with the chariot, too. Good guess. They're all good guesses. Think about you're on a horse. I'm on a horse, I'm riding. And I'm with a sword, gonna have the enemy, and I like this. Like what can happen very easily? Fall off. Fall off. Why don't you why is it what do you need to say on the horse? Not just a saddle. Stirrups. Did someone say that? Stirrups have not been invented yet. And so it's really easy just to be pulled off a horse. You need a thing to lock you in. So stirrups we developed there, we got another couple thousand years. And then the Roman cavalry started using it. Then it was kind of forgotten. Then it would come back to Europe. You know, one of those things you don't think about, then I said, oh yeah, that makes sense. Stirrup. Even though, you know, obviously they did it without it. So they had chariots. And it would normally be an archer and the person riding it, and that'd be pretty darn good to be firing while moving on a chariot. The wheels, this is a rough ride. There are no shocks. There are no road. That's a pretty hard ride. But two horses pulling a chariot, anybody want to stand in its way? Yeah. Yeah. Horses are big. They run right through you. And they could put a scythe or a blade on the wheels and cut through. They didn't actually, rarely actually cut somebody. But if you see a chariot come at you and they got blades sticking out of the wheels, all right, you get it. <laughs> of course, then what do you have to do? Just dig a trench. It's, it's relatively easy to stop, but you have to be very disciplined. So undisciplined forces, chariot cavalry just kept. So this is where the cities would be. You see them kind of moving up here, but they're going to be invaders into here because they're going to have the biggest food surpluses, the not so much actual wealth, but the beginning of a trade empire. And so let's get, oh, one more thing that's developing. Clearly, there's going to be class differences. Class will be developing. This is a Sumerian art. You know, it's all the bald people. They shave their head. And what are the classes? So the noblemen are going to be atop more and more. The king at first literally uh, defined as the big man. And the big man is generally somebody who might be a very good fighter. That happened a lot, but also somebody who could organize, get people to follow them. Could also be someone who's incredibly cruel and ruthless. Here are noblemen on top, priests and priestesses. Free commoners, they might be landholders or the skilled craftsmen or artisans or the ones who are the you know, weavers, um, coopers making barrels, working the granary, whatever it might be. And then, of course, on the bottom, oh, new bottom. On the bottom are going to be, they call them dependent classes. They're not slaves. They're closer to serfs that some of you might have heard of from medieval Europe. But they're usually bound to people by debt. And you're going to see this time after time. You're going to see it in Sumeria, Egypt. We're not going to talk about a lot there, but you're really seeing it in Greece. We'll talk about it in Rome. All the way through, get my look at my watch, today. 
people who are tied to jobs, tied to areas by debt. Some of you know what that's like, Our family members like that, or you might be that way someday. Because when you're in debt, you're, I mean, you gotta kind of do whatever it takes to get out of debt. Like for example, keep a job you might not necessarily like. Well, this one, they're basically owned by the people until they pay back their debt. A term you might see in colonial America, some of you have heard the term indentured servant. That's pretty close. They're not quite, but some would be slaves. If they could not pay back their debt, they would be slaves. Sometimes slaves would be captured, sold. But most debtors were people who agreed to become a slave to pay back a debt. That was so very common. And then they might own, they might win their freedom sometime, they might get land once they work a certain number of years. There was no permanent slavery. The rules were much more vague, but they were still slaves. The slavery that a lot of you might be thinking of would be the slavery that formed in colonial America. Permanent slavery. And in colonial America, they'll also begin dividing people up by race, that or by color of skin. That didn't exist. In fact, that would have been seen as very weird till about the 17th century. And that's really not that long ago. I was a little kid then. I remember it vividly. And so with that, here are slaves being uh, taken back captives of war. Sure, they were captives, but they would be more like indentured servants. It was just, it was different. It's not like the slavery you might think of just because if you grow up in the United States or hear about what the United States is, what happened there or in colonial America. So these are the classes. So the Samaritan city states begin to form and by 2500, we have that great city of Ur. They built these massive temples. And one of the things they discover is more and more very elaborate tombs. And that's how we know how the big men would be buried, the royal family. And more and more by about 2500, all the way through, and you see this in Egypt, and we'll see this in the video we watch tomorrow. The tomb, there'll be also servants who will go with them. They will be volunteers to be buried alive with them to serve the big man in the afterlife. Volunteers to volunteer. <laughs> yes. It depends on your point of view. <laughs> so we'll see this a lot. But these city states, walled cities, they form relatively independent, but you could you can imagine how once you got a little powerful and you have debts to pay, you might be eyeing that city next door to get more as gold becomes powerful, more important, I'll oh, take that. The soldiers, et cetera, is coming. And out of this era will be one of the first real, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's kind of a religious story, it's a novel, it's a dramatic epic, and there'll be stories like this time after time after time. The Epic of Gilgamesh, we won these first works of fiction. And we'll see this time we'll mention a story like a Beowulf, the same kind of thing. And there's similar stories where there's going to be a man in Ur who would take over and be known as Sim Gilgamesh will be the big man. And part of his allure is he'll hang out with this uh, hermit named Urkudu, and they would, or Enkidu, I'm sorry, and they would go on these adventures together, this whole dramatic story, and there would be a flood that would cover everything, and they will fight their way through it, through monsters and villains, through it. Here he is fighting various monsters. I love holding the tales. It appears that the monsters, this is a kind of the beginning of a neighboring tribe, but the story of a flood that covered all humanity except for a few that saved, it's pretty clear that in in the Torah, so um, the most important religious book for Jews that would become the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, that flood appears to be coming from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we'll see other stories of flood on the Indus. We'll see stories of flood in, the, in China. It's kind of amazing how this story of the flood seems to be very, um, not universal, but all over the world. Just interesting. I wonder what common thing did that. I mean, Yes, there had to be a series of floods, but there's no indication of a massive flood. Everyone, it's just interesting how they all have that tradition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And well, we'll talk about that when, when, before the massive, or the, um, not the massive, I'm about to, 
Macedonians, but the um, before Agamemnon, yeah. Yeah, everybody ha it's it's kind of amazing. You'll see it in Roman history. So it's interesting how that happens. In Helena, we have the history of the flood here. And ours, they know us. I'll move on. But Gilgamesh, who then, after conquering the Indies, become the great big man and rule his people, and he will have a funeral, and 500 or 600 volunteers will be buried alive with him, and they will go on to immortality and an afterlife. I love how the actual epic says 500 or 600. It couldn't say just 500 or just 600. It had to say 500 or 600. We weren't sure, but all these volunteers came. And they lined up to be buried alive with the big man. The great epic of Gilgamesh. And you hear about Gilgamesh from Zoroastrians. Now, Uruk would be a classic example of one of these city-states that were developed after Uruk. The reason I'm mentioning that is it shows the importance of water. In fact, that's really what Uruk meant. But they had a first system of tax. We see taxation. Uh, records keeping for taxation. They had some remnant, remnants of a written code. We see cuneiform right here. And women had significantly more rights early on in Uruk than what's going to happen in about a thousand years. As tribes come down from the hills, the fight for control, eventually see women lose those rights. In fact, it's going to be just a thousand years after that, that most women are going to be forced to wear veils in Sumerian cities. So these are that is from Uruk. That's a little bit afterwards, but it's an Assyrian drawing supposedly of one of the great leaders of Uruk, Lagesh. And what they found was called the Stella of Vultures. And this is how we know so much. The Stella was a stone, actually it's a stone tower, but it's been broken up into pieces now. But on it are cuneiform, but also pictographs, where it explains the story of Lagash, this big man. And this is supposedly Lagash. You see a number of different pictures of him. You know that picture of the Phalans? That came from that Stella. And so you see a bunch of different cells. I, I guess it's pronounced Stella. I want to say steel because I'm an English speaker, but I'm trying not to. Don't write this next one down. He is called the Lugo Zazanzi, which literally means big man. So that's where the king. But it talks about the conquest of neighboring Ur. Now they're going to take that land, take their wealth, roll that in. And they talked about something called a social, social contract. Some of you might know about a social contract, like, for example, for the Declaration of Independence, where governments have a certain duty to protect people. People give up power to the big man, and the big man promises to protect. Like me, I, I kind of like the big man. Better than Kingfish. One of those two you should call me. But the social contract. And therefore, the king is more than just simply someone who took power. This says, yes, Lagash is power, but I will make sure that you're protected from enemies. We we'll have a water system that works. That was a biggie in the, in the desert. Our walled cities will stand up. You can count on me. That also means if I break that contract, get rid of it. In the Declaration of Independence of the United States, one of the justifications were that the British, that governments have a certain uh, duty to protect people's rights. The British have denied people's rights, so it is okay for, it is the duty, the responsibility of the people of the colonies to rebel and form their own country. That is a social contract. So, after that, they go from individual city states to a series of invaders from the north came sweeping in called the Acadians. And the Acadians, a relatively short time, but have great, dramatic impact. There's Lagos. But the Acadians, these invaders, and what they had is okay, not so much spears as in spears with metal tips. Uh, you know, so much more effective. It was pretty common to have a, a leather shield, but the spear tip you get to it. Spear, the metal tip. And better bows and arrows. And bows and arrows on chariots. The Arcadians swept through, and they soon cornered, they literally called it the four corners of the world. 
okay, the four corners of the world was basically the first aggressive, but this is our first act, an empire under one central location. And they conquered all the Sumerian city-states. And so you have this weird combination of these people from the north who swept in with long beards and long hair and these shaved-headed, onion-eating Sumerians. This will come back in a second, but the most famous of the Akkadian kings. We got this. We ready to move? Sargon. Sargon, coming out of Zagassi, would be a long-term emperor. He would conquer what they literally called the four corners of the world. Here, 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 and here. Here is one of the most famous masks of Sargon, two versions of that. Constant warfare. Sargon would rule for an incredibly long time. And we're talking 55 years. I mean, the guy was in power for a very long time. And it's not that the Akkadians lasted that long, but they mold this together and set the precedent of an empire. And here's the thing about an empire. They started getting this empire, they need more gold. How do you get more gold? You have two ways, trade more and try to trade for more gold, gold or keep getting more. And this is what we're gonna see time after time. They kept expanding to get more gold, to pay back their debts, to get bigger, and then when the great leader passes away, they can't hold the empire of crumbles. And then what happens? Somebody tries it again, and then it crumbles. Time after time, unless they get a state where they can control the trade and have a more stable empire, that's part of the reason why the Roman Empire lasted so long. And I know what you're thinking, but I want to make cardboard cutouts of this. Yes, you can buy cardboard cutouts of all the ancient armies, I found this, you can make little cutouts, and you can have little chariots and men. So that's what we're going to do all fourth quarter. It's just set up little soldiers to fight each other. I don't know, pretty funny. I wonder if anybody actually makes those or just buy them to buy them. I don't know. But there's a weird mix of Sumer, Sumer and Arcadian religions. And they both worship, one of their main religious symbols was a bull. I love the picture of the bull dancing with Sargon. Bull, ever been around a bull? They can dance. And so when they would talk to one of the holy bulls, a Akkadian priest would be one ear and the Sumerian priest would be the other, and they'd whisper to it, and then they'd listen to the bull. Okay, it wouldn't be that good for the bull because they'd cut it open and read its kidneys, but that's another story. And so with that, Narm Sin would be the next one. Narm Sin would be the last one, and he would literally call himself the king of the universe. And this king of the universe, he controlled all four quarters. Here is a Stella of Narm Sin standing over all he conquers. So Narm Sin would become just the name. And so you're going to see there's like four emperors of the future Assyrian Empire. They're going to be called Naram Sin. Think of it like Naram Sin is going to be like a Caesar. Yeah, the name, wow, I'm Naram Sin. Ooh, he's the descendant. And they were, I am the descendant of Naram Sin. And two temples at Nippur and Ekur, at Ur, he destroyed. And there was, and the priest there said, if you destroy this, your empire will collapse. This became the curse of Naram Sin. Why am I mentioning this? Because what happened to the empire as soon as he died? It, it collapsed. Now, was it because of the curse? Yes. It was because of the curse. Well, maybe. I don't know. But we have the curse. But what happened is they had been irrigating. And as they've been irrigating, they were already putting this didn't I tell you what happened with the irrigation? What, what does irrigation do to the soil eventually? Oh. Yeah, it gets the, oil, the, the soil salty. Well, they started more salt in the soil and then it rained, or quickly. A drought, salty soil, the desert expanded. And once that happened, these great cities 
turn to dust. It's one of those great what ifs in history, but it's pretty clear Iraq used to be significantly more, more vegetation. But they planted all that, you know, they planted, they cultivated and ruined the soil. <laughs> so once that happened, empire gone, 50 year drought. And this is one of the reasons why when European explorers went there in the future, they discovered just all oh, these amazing artifacts all buried by sand It kind of blew them away. Wait a second, this is a desert. We heard stories about this, but we didn't quite believe it, at least not here. We heard about the Persian Empire, but we didn't believe it. And they saw the extent of this. And then of course, once it collapses, here come invaders, the invaders had better chariots, and it all fell. We will see this time after time. A very similar time, there's gonna be invaders of the North that are gonna, they're gonna get Egypt, they're gonna get Greece. Because while this is happening, Food and the trade is winding its way to the Nile, and Egypt is just starting at this time. So Egypt is taking advantage of that. And about 500 years behind, going this way, it's getting into Greece. And once it gets into Greece, you start seeing it spreading this way, and what's next? Wyoming, all the way to Wyoming. Might take a few years after that. So after, the invaders, the next empire, the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, you're going to see a few different Babylonian empires. This is going to be their first golden age. And they'll take many of the Sumerian religions, but we see a new, more important religious figure who has cloven hooves named Marduk. Somebody see Marduk as a person with cloven hooves. Somebody see Marduk as kind of this half tiger, half weird thing with a long neck. But Marduk is going to have supernatural powers and can be more and more like a Greek god. You know, like doing things like uh, getting involved with personal affairs and things such as that. And this is where we get um, the epic of Gilgamesh becomes an epic of the creation of the world. And here is eventually the Babylonian Empire. But I want to get to one more thing before we get there. I'm going to talk about the quote of Hammurabi. I didn't quite get there. So we're going to address Hittites, Syrians. One more thing we need to do real fast. I'm not going to cover all these. I kind of pick and choose. But the new Babylonian Empire, last thing for today, they would make to go into the city the Ishtar Gate. And the Ishtar Gate would be this monumental walled city where they would go, go! So not walled city, amazing fact. This is a reconstruction. It's today in Iraq, but it's blue, blue tile, and a pretty amazing place. Well, some explorers, some explorers slash a new thing you might've heard of called archeologists in the 19th century, late 19th century, they were from Germany and they came through and they discovered this. Now, Cole, I'm not going to say it again. You're going to have to sit up. I don't like seeing the top of your head. If I see that again, then are you writing down this to me? They took it and they brought it to Berlin. And this is in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. It's one of the more amazing things I've ever seen. So I've heard about this museum. It's this massive, it's on Museum Island in Berlin. And you go to this big, huge granite building, and it is covered with shell holes, pockmarked with cannon shell holes. Germans held out in there in April of 1945 when the Soviets were attacking. And it's still there to this day. There are still shell holes in this big, massive museum. And you go to this museum that's incredible Egyptian art, this uh, wall from Pergamon, which we'll get to later, and then these tiles. And you walk in, it's all going to go into the Ishtar Gate, which they stole from Iraq, and they're not going to give it. They claim that they're not going to give it back because they can protect it, but you can imagine how, just like Egyptian ruins in Britain, they're kind of mad that they stole those ruins. But you walk in, and it's just this massive blue tile. Game. So look how big it is. 
It's huge, and it's got Marduk and other creatures on it, and it goes on for nearly 50 yards of this wall, which is supposed to be the grand entrance, where all decorated with these magnificent lions. And you walk along, and it's just, it is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. And if you ever get a chance, field trip to Berlin? Have you been to Berlin? Many times, well, yeah, I'd jump on the train or walk. Drive. Sure. But yeah, it's really not that far from here. You're near Super, right? Have you been to this museum? It's it, it is I'm not exaggerating, am I? It's it's why was it cool? Field trip? You're our guide. Let me get my 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 nephew uh, Alec, who is I guess he'd be the equivalent of a freshman in high school. Right? He'd be a freshman, I mean, freshman, but he could take us there. And here, I have Alec who lives in uh, a nephew Alec who lives in Berlin, and a nephew Alex. I am not making that up. Who lives in Italy? Yes. And there's Marduk. See the cloven hooves? If we get a chance, I, I really like it. Okay, so there'll be a few little pieces I'll pick up, but I'm sorry I'm out of order. Egypt tomorrow, we good with that? So come in, we'll take roll. They'll hand out the worksheet, we'll watch it. We're not gonna finish it, but I really like the Engineering and Empire. I know at least one person has seen Engineering and Empire, right? Yes. And they're pretty good, aren't they? They're really good. We have this one, we have one of the Greeks, one of the Romans we watch. You will like it. Yeah, yeah, there's no. I think, Carson, I think it tells you the history, but I, I love seeing how they built. I think it's really cool. They were so talented and smart. And at the same time, forcing other people at knife point to do it. I know, I know. Sister is trying to go. She lives in the pretty far north. A five hour day. It's a lot for the north. The slums are a little longer, a lot longer. Have a good day, everybody! I know you get tired all the time. That's your discipline, right? You have to be. It says it on your shirt. So. If I go so to the top, it's doing that. Oh, and then carrying your. Yeah. And you know. And ultimately, just. Oh, but. I know, I know. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I didn't get the frisbee out. Come on. Come on. That's oh, oh, you are getting good at this. I've been practicing. Well, oh, play, that was too easy. We are getting good at that. Everybody, we're going to ride a Marduk to school tomorrow. Yeah. Water bottle. 
Take out the worksheet for the fog of war. And he would be he would retire in sixty three. The United States would fully commit they were sending they were sending advice to the people of Ukraine and the early state did not enforce the trips in sixty five. And McNamara was second paragraph. Yes, we'll get to it. All right, everybody. Let's take off the worksheet. We are on oh Ford. The first thought we're gonna run a bar do. Who has a Marduk? Yeah. Marduk. Globe and hooves. Kind of half dragon. Curly tail. Scales. Where is that? That is actually in Ireland. A Marduk. Yeah, it's, it's a Babylonian god. It's on, it's on this one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's actually a good answer. A Babylonian god. All right. So we are right on. He's at four. Remember, he, he, he Okay. Nobody wore seatbelts for a long time after this, but he was the first one to. He actually pushed putting seatbelts on fours. Yes, seatbelts then would go under the seats, and nobody ever wore seatbelts. I, I, it's hard for me to remember anybody wearing a seatbelt. We didn't want to. Oh, yeah. No, nobody wore seatbelts. And another thing, too, there were no car seats for kids. We were tough. I remember being a little kid standing up on the front seat as we go. Just take a left picture. My seatbelt was my dad and gave a very cool one like this. <laughs> and they showed that that Ford Galaxy. That's the car we have. A red Ford Galaxy. 
Yeah, All right, so let's go and get to the video, but I have bad news for you before we get started. I've told, tell me you already know because you're in other classes, I am not going to be here tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, it's not. Yeah, no, no questions. I will not answer any questions no matter what. Yes. Yeah, it's not. You're not here. You can try. I don't know. I'm, somebody will probably take role. And they're watching. What's the mission about? I, I, well, obviously, if I tell you. Hey, we're, we're not going to be here tomorrow, so we have uh, a couple different options what we're going to do, but uh, all of them are going to involve good shoots. To bring good shoots. Well, I'm thinking repelling. Another thing I'm thinking about, and I've heard somebody was telling me there's dirt in my hole out there. Well, no, there's dirt in it. So where did you go? I don't even know. Okay, good thing I didn't hear what you said, right? We might, we we might do a couple different things. But I want to be here because I always got to explain stuff during the video. But I might let you play the current events game. Hmm? It's a round. Just explain. It's a game. The current events game. I'm going to stand on the door. But the winner, I, I will decide because I like being here because there's certain things I have to explain because he, he, you know. During the video, but I might also show we might also finish the video. But I'll let you know. Let me rephrase that. Whoever's my sub will let you know tomorrow. Play the current events game. Oh, let's go. 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 let us go let us go let you know the concept of a game. Okay, yeah. yeah, let's go. Huh? That's why I said bring good shoes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Here we go. Four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give me a second. Oh, there's, there's dirt in the hole. 